have with us Dr. Wakil, who can please tell us a little bit about the church's efforts about towards clean elections so that actually we can, you know, it says framing the issues in Nagaland. Yes, we will get Dr. Pangar as well. Don't worry about it. He will tell us about the contemporary efforts towards clean elections, just about what were the issues that you focused on historically before when the church did take up the issue and when was it? If you can just tell us a little bit with vis-a-vis -vis, were these problems still existing at that time and just, uh, just explain to us maybe what happened in the last few years. I think empirically you observe the things are not working well. So uh, what is what I see right now is uh, if we trace back to what happened 25 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, the process of uh, bringing some form of social change in our context, particularly in the area of politics. We are beginning to see now um, more so uh, see this in, in the form of symbolic politics. And symbolic politics is very, very important for any kind of a change to occur. Perhaps it's a term that I need to sort of um, unpack. Symbolic politics is happening because one, one symbolism is the church is talking about it. So like that's what it is. The media is playing an important role. That's one, one aspect of it. And this kind of a deliberation is also another. And what we will see happen more and more in, the, in, in days to come is this symbolic politics is going to, uh, will, will, will gain momentum, I think, all right? In terms of not only media playing its part, the church playing its part, but even in, 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 in terms of um, um, posters, okay, rallies, music, in terms of songs, young people, you, should, you ought to write songs relating to elections as well. So these are, these are some of the things that I see happening, and I see this as, a, as very positive. Uh, my question to the Honorable Minister, he has mentioned about the pattern of voting in the rural area as well as the urban area. Several points, three or four points, but he has either uh, intentionally or unintentionally did not mention about the noises created by the non-state actors, the armed groups. The armed groups, is all, armed groups are always creating a problem in the voting pattern, especially in the rural area. So that's one point. And how you are going to tackle this? How we are going to tackle this? As far as the involvement of the armed group is concerned, I think uh, no one has the answer to that. I don't think anyone will be able to say that we can control or handle them in this manner or that manner. It is, uh, uh, it's, uh, by saying so, I don't mean that we are giving them a free hand also. But of course, <coughs> educating them in one way, uh, they should not be involved in the state politics. But as I said, we have no control on them. At the most, we can make them understand. And I think every election, we try to do that. But uh, it all depends on how much effort we make to make them understand. I don't know whether that satisfies your question. Actually, in the selection of candidates is a good question. Mr. Su, why don't you tell us a little bit about how are candidates? <coughs> how are candidates selected? How, I mean, who decides who is the candidate? Give us a little bit of reflection on how it works. Yeah, yes, <coughs> so the question became, but the minister and I were just having a discussion before coming up here also. So he also said, Whenever a person decides to contest for election, he does not think that I'm going to loot the people, I'm going to destroy the state, I'm going to bring down the state. He also contests election for a reason. He has a vision, he wants to develop his people, he wants to develop his state. But unfortunately, it's not the people. It is the system that sort of, you know, really pulls the, 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 the leader down. So, like I said, the vicious circle, no one is to be blamed. All of us are to be blamed. So we have to take equal responsibility. Yeah, I just, yeah. I, I, how do we choose a candidate? See, to me, no one chooses me. I choose to be a politician. And people <laughs> accepted that. So to be a leader, I think 
it is for a person to decide what kind of role he wants to play in the society. So the first thing for me as a politician, I choose this profession and people accepted it. Now, when you are in a position when people do not come forward, I think it's for the people to really look at the person concerned that you are identifying as your leader. As uh, Uncle Pyuto has rightly mentioned, we are looking at someone who has money. We are looking at someone who has more link, but not really the intention, the integrity of the person concerned. So I think the, uh, the most challenging part or uh, challenging thing on our part is that when we look for a candidate, we will really have to see uh, his credibility, not his money, <coughs> power or any other, but the first and foremost is his credibility, his integrity. I think that should be the beginning of choosing a candidate. And as I said, for me, I choose to be a politician. Thank you. Just a couple of questions. And you know, often, the, you know, when, when we look at politicians, they look as the enemy of the state. You know, the politician is never the good guy. He's got the pawns and he's the devil and he's not making electricity for us and things like that. And in this whole, uh, and we know that as Nagas, uh, social capital, um, our biggest social capital is the community, and you get into politics because you want to serve the people. Now, when there are so many agencies that are trying to do clean elections, for example, you've got a youth organization, you've got uh, NBCC, you've got so many who have a common shared value because everybody wants to see that there are good things that happen for the state. How do politicians participate in this? Because whenever a politician wants to come and maybe help with funding, they're like, no, you know, you're NPF, we won't take your money, or you're in Congress, we won't take your money. How do politi uh, politicians participate in dialogues with civil societies, with, you know, with bureaucrats, with youth organizations, the role of it? You know, I, I just want to know, sir, if you, know, if you had a chance to participate in this, what, what kind of participation would that be? I think uh, there has been, dialogue from the beginning of so but seriously it has not been we have not reached to the level of seriousness where we really try to bring changes uh, uh, I think uh, what uh, you have initiated is a path like organizing a common platform these are opportunities where uh, you are, the politicians are bound to come forward even if you if they are, don't like to, they are bound to come forward. So I think those are very good initiatives that needs to be carried on further, I think. Uh, I don't know what, uh, how to ready answer a uh, uh, question, but I think uh, these are some of the options uh, that we, 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 we need to more intensify. And you really have to engage the political parties, as uh, I mentioned earlier. You really have to engage the political parties because if you don't engage them, even if you keep on engaging the voters, the political parties will definitely, they are bound to play to come back to power, whoever the political parties are. So the most important is engage the political parties, like in Nagaland we have the BJP, the NPA, or any other political party. My question to the Honorable Minister is, how much did you spend in the last election? <laughs> 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 Thanks to Madam for trying to open our mind by your mathematics. I'm so convinced that our government is a government of growth bodies need to go on making decision for crore bodies, there will be no common man, Ahmad me, who will be able to live in this land a few years from now. I'm so convinced. In fact, I'm a member of NBCC Clean Election Campaign Committee, but on two occasions I have not attended the meeting because I really didn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. But today I'm convinced every day around 400 students 
come to my classroom. I pledge myself to talk about the election. If all of us can do that, I think we could see the light at the end of the tunnel, maybe 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Education of the people, both the politicians as well as the voters like us, I think there lies the key to the answer. of this problem, to have a clean election, to have a clean leader, to have a nice, better system where clean people can work and shine. This is my reaction, my conclusion. Thank you. So candidates are supposed to file in an affidavit, sir, right? After the elections, yes. and also put in an affidavit saying how much money has been spent all the candidates, 184 candidates, have said that they have spent less than 20 likes in their academics. <laughs> and of course, yes, we did share the report with the, the State Election Commission as well. And uh, they were not very happy because they get into trouble again. The State Election Commission will get into the trouble if, you know, we wanted to make it public, I mean, official that we, of course, we did a lot of publicity to the local papers and to social media and all those things, but officially to be accepted by the government, uh, they were not willing to do it because the State Election Commission would get into trouble because the, the slab shows 20 lakhs per candidate, but you can see it's, it's spending course. So, yeah. To my understanding, the whole component of what we have discussed, spending crores of money by 2008, 2013, uh, to me, these are all because of tendency of winning. Okay. Now, why do we talk about tendency of winning and clean election? Is there any chance? Because tendency of winning and clean election is too parallel thing, to my understanding. So, is there any chance where clean election can reciprocate with tendency of winning? Good number of retired bureaucrats whom I know, I have been telling them also. I have told them also. At this rate, what will happen to your children and grandchildren? Why don't you go for election without money? Go for a trial. Set an example. Set the mindset that you have set. Winning and losing is a, is a part of the game in life. But without spending money, go and have a clean election. Thank you very much. That's all I've got to share. Social change, social transformation. I think it takes time. It's a very slow process. What I see as a politician today, as a decision maker, the transition from Naga people, the transition from uh, no money, we don't need, we, we were not in need of money those days, to a stage where money becomes very essential. We, we are not serious about education. Suddenly education came to our land, and the need for education came up very urgently. I think the transition has not been really smooth yet. That's the reason why we are suffering. Economic progress, what the girl out there raised, that's a very important issue that she has raised. How about people in the villages, in the rural areas? How would they survive? Earlier, there, there was no need for money, but now they have to send the children to Kohima or far flung areas, where do they get money? So to me, yes, the transition and the plan, the action plan, I think has not been really smooth yet. We are agree-based agriculture by profession, but we really have not encouraged agriculture to the need of the people where we all can actually survive, become even rich. But we really have discarded agriculture. We really have discarded our products in the rural area. And the rush is for only Kohima and Jumabo. That's where we are. And again, 
even the state government in itself, political instability has also contributed a lot of problem to the state. For instance, this dinner, 2014 we had three months problem, 2015 we had problem, this year also we had one year. We just have few working months and we wasted the best months. So politi political instability has also contributed its part to the politicians not being able to tread laws or rules that actually that would really require. Uh, and there, there I said, like uh, so many departments are lagging behind. For instance, PWD, I feel very sorry about the road condition in the entire state of Nagaland. But uh, I have been explaining this wherever I go. Till now, the government of the RNG department, road and bridges department, do not have a maintenance policy. This is one big problem. 54 years of statehood, and we are not, we don't have a road maintenance policy. It is already framed. It is, a, it is yet to be uh, uh, adopted. Once that system comes into being, then whatever money we get for development, it will be judiciously applied. Uh, the other problem is also because of the change of policy in the central government now. Since the BJP came into power in 2014, there is a change of funding system. We were a welfare state. We were surviving only from the money received from the central government. But that is, have been removed already from 2014. And we are reduced to what we are. So when we look at ourselves, there's nothing because we don't generate any, any revenue. We don't make any money. Whatever comes from the center, we are just consuming it. Another year, we were just waiting for the center to give us money, consume it. That was, that was the practice. And that's why we are running short of money the last two, three years, uh, even for running this maintenance of road or in any department because the state does not have enough money. That is why we are uh, 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 we are positioning ourselves. It's not only the responsibility of the decision makers, but it's also the public. We will also have to contribute. Anywhere in the world you see people pay professional tax or people also give back to the government. But this is not done in Nagaland. And this is why we have been educating, we have been are arching the people that no, we must change, we must also give back to the government and also expect from the government. So under all these circumstances, um, we, we, we really understand the situation, but it's going to take a little more time. And I totally agree with what Dr. what you say. It will take time, the social change, but by saying so, we should not give up, we should keep the fight on, and at the same time, Government policies should come in line with the change that is required. And I think if we can, if we are able to do that, then we will expect change faster than we are looking for. Thank you. Can we talk a little bit about the clean election campaign and how campaigns like these really tie a lot of these issues together and how they have been tying these issues together? And for that, I request Dr. Pangar to please highlight uh, some of the things that have been done already as part of clean election campaigns and how to go further bringing all these issues that we have got right now together. If you could, just a few words. First, uh, I, I really affirm what our minister has mentioned about taking the parties on board, the political parties. And uh, uh, if oh, my memory is correct, when the Mizoram People's Forum launched their clean election campaign, I just reconfirmed this uh, from uh, some of the leaders. Uh, they had a, the first time they launched their campaign, they had an intensive four hours sitting with the political parties and actually hammered out all the guidelines and commitments. And that is how actually they went forward. The first thing they did was actually to sit with the political parties. And I think that is what the clean election campaign should be doing. But and I think that's, that's already there, the agenda is there. Um, from what I understand, I'm not speaking on behalf of NBCC, but I'm aware that the uh, clean election team is working, first of all, to bring together the denominations. 
and uh, from there take things forward. Um, there's also an understanding that uh, people are frustrated with the government and politicians and so forth and so many people in the clean election have been actually emphasizing awareness, giving awareness to the public, getting more, uh, uh, getting to the people, grassroots. And there is now serious uh, exercises being put together to make the campaign more organized, more professional, uh, and more aggressive and intentional. My, uh, my question, to our honorable minister would be, uh, given your reading of the situation today in the Naga context, what kind of an election do you imagine, anticipate? It's, it's, it's an open-ended, because then people also working, for people, for, people working for free and fair elections, be it youth net, several groups, NBCC and churches, are more prepared. When the clean election was launched last 2013, I think, uh, I don't know in other parts, but in Obodo, uh, I was sharing my concerns with the church in Sabak. It is possible we can have clean election. It's just that uh, we should go a little bit beyond preaching or giving lecture from the pulpit. If we just end up preaching or or talking from the pulpit, then it will it will just we will just get the same result. I had mentioned in my earlier in my short uh, speech that uh, even that there was lots of positive effect. There was lots of positive effect, particularly in Bogoto, in my constituency the use of alcohol was reduced. We, we did not run any mess. Otherwise, in other situations, in other years, there were hundreds and thousands of people coming as though they don't cook food in their house. They would come and spend time eating in the mess. This all was reduced. Also, unnecessary travel was also cut down. So I can assure that uh, we can have clean elections. Nagaland. Nagas are very sensible. Mm. Only we have to really approach them in the right manner. So who should be serious here? I think as a student, and I'm so happy that there are so many students today. You look young, maybe you are professionals, I don't know. But whether you are professional or you're still a student, it is the youth. I was sharing with Hagani. I think the youth now should also find out where does this <coughs> Crores of money goes there. Does it goes to build people houses? Or does it goes to build what? It's amazing. It's just delicious. I didn't see the teacher had asked me about how, how much I spent. I'll just tell you I didn't spend much. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't spend much, truly, really. But it's amazing the amount of money we spend. Where does it go? Where does it go? It's really amazing. So uh, if the youth, if the youth can come forward, who, which section of the voters demands money? The youth or the elder reserves? The children are not involved. It's 19 years apart. So it's the youth that is asking money or the elderly citizens that is asking, or you want to put the women's group together. Is the women's group demanding? Which group is demanding money? I think our elderly, citizens, elderly people, they don't need money. As I've said earlier, I've come across people who have not touched money or anything about election. They have to remain very clean. So it is possible. Only thing is, how do we use different channels to do this? And uh, the most important to me, I think, would be the youth. If the youth can come forward, if the students can come forward, then we can have clean election. I see a very, uh, 2018, I can see a very clean election. <laughs> My question is, are they uh, monitored? And then like, are they given those specific 
um, guidelines where, uh, where and how those elections will be conducted. Thank you. See, it's not uh, a politician. As the candidate, I'm single. But it's the public. So I think it's more to do with the voter than the candidate, if uh, you would agree with me. It's more to do with the public than the candidate. Candidate, in order to win, he will have to go by the direction you give. That's how things are going on. <coughs> so to me, it's uh, the public is more important than the candidate. How you want to use your candidate? Uh, for elections, the do's and don'ts, uh, there's something called representative of people's act. There's an act which frames the rules and regulations of what should be done and what should not be done during elections. We have the, under that, we have a various model code of conduct that we need to follow during elections. Um, unfortunately, like I said earlier, India has some of the best framed rules and you know acts and all those things. But implementation is so, so weak, not just in Nagaland, but India as a whole. Unfortunately, the implementation is so weak that has been you know, really bringing down the system. Our youths, I think, uh, I've been repeatedly saying this, but our youth should come up. You'll have to come up because it is your future, our future, not your, your, your dad or your mom. They are all 50, 60 plus. We are talking about our own future. How you want to build our future? Look at a candidate. Look for a candidate who does not only talk about the welfare of your constituency alone, who does not only talk about the welfare of your tribe alone, because we are a community of 16 plus tribes. Look for a person who thinks for the whole of the Naga. Nagas are getting bifurcated, getting divided into groups, sections, and whatnot. So look for a candidate who is integrated. Integrity, to me, I would mean is people who has concern for the entire Naga. You have to look for such people in your constituency. Look for a candidate who spends more time on development, not on appointment alone. <laughs> not on, don't look at someone who can give or judge someone on the basis of getting financial help alone or getting government job alone. But look at the candidate, look at the person who has the vision to develop Nagaland. Who has the vision to develop your constituency? Our children are married. I have a son studying in Delhi. He has, or so many of us, some of us has our students, our children in, in America. They would not like to come back and work in a place like us, Nagaland, if we don't create the infrastructure. That is the danger ahead of us. Many of you would not like to. You would like to sit in a place like this, always to work in a hot climate like Zimbabwe. But we don't have this kind of facilities. And that's where the challenge lies. So therefore, you look for a candidate who has a vision to develop Nagaland, who has a vision to develop your constituency, who has a mind, who is broad-minded, who talks about the entire Naga, not only your tribe, not only your country. <coughs> If we look for that, I think we can have clean election and we can have Nagaland of our dream. Thank you. In the next election, uh, we'll see the statistics. In the next election, do you think it is possible for a candidate to win that election without using money, excessive amount of money? Because we've seen that the amount of money that is being used is increasing. So do you think it is possible? And the second question is, uh, you said the problem is with the demand of the people. But isn't it a problem with the candidate at the same time when he's unable to say no to the people when they're demanding, but he's unable to say no because he wants to be in that position, because he wants to be in a particular position. So isn't it the fault of the candidate as well, if not more? Okay. Everybody is talking about the role of money and then how we people ask for money, candidates give us money. But this is a question, particularly, please don't feel like I'm targeting you, but to the MPCC. As the spearheaders of the clean election campaign, 
What are we as supporters of the election doing to involve the village members, particularly at the council level, mm. in our green election campaign? Because, like, some of the elders might feel I'm being very outspoken, you know, because I'm a girl, so I'm not supposed to be outspoken. <laughs> See, like, that is what we are taught when I was, like, when we are kids, okay? But I just want to say this, because if during the past two elections, the 2008 and 2013, I have noticed that during elections, the village council decides who will participate in the election, who will be the candidate, and during the time of mm -hmm. elections, all the people of that particular village, wherever they live, they have to go back to their village, and they have to vote for that particular candidate. Maybe it's only my district, I don't know about the others, but... I wanted to know what we are doing to involve them in our clean election campaign. Thank you. In, in relation to clean election, if it's successful and uh, if something happens like people stop taking the money this time around, uh, well, what will be the alternate me method you know, for the politicians? Uh, because you are not going to give money anymore, and so how are you going to uh, you know, exhibit your, your uh, goals, aims? And will people be ready to, uh, you know, to consider those things? Will they be equipped to understand what the politicians will be talking? That's the question. Structural changes, I think, system changes also require nothing. We have, we missed one of the speakers today. If she had come, I think she would have addressed some of these problems. I totally agree. We're in a village. Village make a resolution to let only one person vote. That if they would come to second man's country. I think those practices should go away if we really uh, uh, talk about green election. So that's what I mean that s certain systems need changes. But then we will see, we, uh, we, uh, we will see how best we can handle those issues in the coming years. We do have manifestos. As a political party, we have manifesto, common minimum, minimum program in five years, we will do this, we will do that. But who throws away this manifesto? It's the public. We want to really stick on to the manifesto that we have committed to the people. But we are not allowed to do that. This is the problem. And the entire blame comes to the politicians later on. But actually, we need a common, a mass realization and focus our attention towards development. Election is for development to me. And development, there is everything there. And uh, I think there is no difficulty in handling a situation where you don't spend money in election. There's no situation at all when you don't have, when you don't have to spend money. I think whether we will be able to do that is the big question. Otherwise, not spending money, there is no issue at all. Actually, that's what we're looking for. Okay. okay, so here, I would like to um, beg to differ a little bit from our other minister has said. For me, I believe that um, it's indirectly, it, it, the, the state deficit is indirectly connected, directly, indirectly connected to all these expenses that uh, uh, we are seeing. Uh, like I said earlier, development work is being compromised once people come to power, obviously for whatever reasons that we've discussed. Uh, development work has been compromised. Obviously when infrastructure and the system is not in place, the private sector and entrepreneurs are not going to flourish. And when there is no private sector, when there is no entrepreneurs in the state, we, we can't imagine having any type of revenue in the state. So yes, it's connected. So we need to uh, realize this uh, uh, very basic issue. Election malpractices has entered all the system. All of us are responsible. The public, yes. But I think at this point, we're looking for, even the younger generation is looking for politicians and candidates who will come up and say, I'm going to contest, but whether I win or lose, I'm not going to give away money. And I think we want role models here at this point. Yeah. And more than that, <coughs> we want Political parties, candidates, I'm not telling you, okay? <laughs> uh, I have a lot of form of the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not to wait for you, Ted, and NBCC. Please, political parties, call the church, people interested in election, and say, come, let's make a deal. 
you tribal hohos, youth play, church, go and tell your people not to take money. Let us, we will also declare that we are not going to give money. And I think there has to be a win-win deal situation here. Okay. <laughs> to talk on something like election, I find it very uncomfortable. The reason being, I've never voted, <laughs> and I doubt I ever will, <laughs> because of my own political position. But having said that, why? Because we have come to a time when election is not just election. It is affecting every aspect of our human life. The culture of impunity, a corrupt system, where we are getting more fragmented, where there is chaos, where there is perhaps expectations and unfulfilled promises, and so on and so forth. So I think, I mean, it was, I'm glad to hear that elections cannot be seen in isolation. It is part of a social movement. And perhaps that is where the people who are spearheading the clean election campaign must locate the clean election campaign within a broader social movement. In other words, the clean election campaign is one strand in a spider web. But again, there's another question to that. Is that, yes, it is part of a social movement, social change, but do we follow the process of reformation or do we follow the path of revolution? And this is where I think we are diverting. For me personally, I feel we should follow the path of revolution. Because it is consistent with the values and principles of social change. Where the reformation perhaps is just resetting this room, but revolution perhaps would be changing this very room itself. In other words, changing the system itself. And I think that is where we need to be clear. <coughs> also, in the course of social change, we are confronted with the question of truth. And here we seem to be faced with two opposing truths. One is the truth that gives light, that <coughs> reveals, and there is the other truth that obscures and acts like a veil. And the clean election campaign, I think, it is faced with this dilemma of revealing the truth in the sense of revealing the light or revealing the truth which is acting like a veil. Now our people need to decide which truth it wants to follow. So with that, I want to thank all of you for taking the time we sat here for a little of about three hours. And once again, thank you, Ali, and thank you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Nabi Tashiri could not be here with us this afternoon. But it is a hope that in the coming months, that since elections has become fundamental in one form or the other to the present state of affairs in Nagaland, where we hope that we will continue this dialogue around the issue of clean election with different representatives coming. So thank you all so much for your time. And please, do not hesitate to give us suggestions how we can improve, uh, give us advice, yes, criticize us uh, in a way that would also enable us, that would inspire us to become more responsible and accountable to all of you. So thank you so much.